I'm live. <clears throat> well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Nada, for inviting me today. Um, as you see, I'm a professor in the Department of Architecture. I'm also adjunct in architecture and architecture and planning. Um, and I direct a lab called the Green Futures Lab at the University of Washington that um, focuses on green infrastructure. I've been teaching at the University of Washington since 2001, and before that, I worked at a professionally in landscape architecture for about a dozen years, uh, mostly in a firm called Jones and Jones Architects and Landscape Architects, which is an integrated design firm. So. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking about this concept of generosity that we've experienced especially here uh, and uh, the travel uh, studio service learning uh, experiences that we've had in New Zealand, um, and as well as another one that I'll tell you a little bit. And Heather Parker, who's our teaching assistant for our current study tour, uh, is also going to be telling you about our, our current study abroad program in Christchurch. So, um, What's interesting is that um, uh, my first time in New Zealand was in 2004 to attend the CELA conference, that's the Council, Council of Educators in Landscape Architecture, where I gave a presentation on practicing the scholarship of engagement. So the talk was an academic talk that examined this framework of what was called engaged scholarship. It was kind of new at the time was put forth by the Carnegie Foundation. And then I used a studio project that I had led uh, in Homer, Alaska, um, where a group had traveled as an example. It was quite early in my academic career. Um, a bit about this idea of generosity. Um, because beyond this academic scholarship aspect of my teaching, my attendant, attention has turned more towards what kind of impact can we have? both on the students and on the community, uh, and the exchange experience and interaction, and especially of this role of generosity. Um, so what does, what does this generosity idea mean? Where, where can it get us? Why does it matter? Well, of course, there is this awesome exchange of knowledge and values that people give their generosity of time, their passions, um, generos generosity in teaching and learning. Um, and then in our discipline, it leads us to explore what could be. It's not just that solution that's right in front of you, but that there is this range of possibilities in our um, environment and, and ideas. Uh, and that, of course, then generates new potentials in communities that could be ecological, cultural, social, hopefully those are put together, that um, it increases life. And then, uh, and then friendships are also forged through that, which are incredibly important. So um, the first sort of quick um, study tour that I want to talk about has uh, been funded through the generosity of a local foundation in Seattle. Uh, it's, uh, the mission of the foundation is to promote Danish-American relationships. So for the last 12 years, I've taken students to Copenhagen, Denmark, and then also Malmo, Sweden, which is right next door, on a two-week tour. And there are two people in the room who've been there with me. Um, and um, we visit offices that are just awesome to show us what they do. We have a series of tours that uh, this past year we were specifically looking at how climate change adaptation and public space could really work together in Copenhagen. And Copenhagen has this amazing program where they've identified 300 projects to solve their climate um, flooding problems, but every one of those projects has to provide good public space. It's not a single value um, solution. It they have, has to do both. We also um, do drawing exercises, and it's a good opportunity to introduce Paul Olson, who's in the back, who's co-leading the New Zealand trip with me, and also goes to Copenhagen, and he really focuses on the media, as well as a lot of bicycling, logistics, and teaching overall. Um, and, uh, and then we come back and uh, have a studio together. So we've been inspired for these two plus weeks. There's usually community engagement uh, with the studio, uh, and students bring back these very rich inspirations to influence 
Seattle's urban design, culture, and environment, which I can testify has really happened. Um, this past year, we worked with what's called the Capitol Hill Eco District on plans for how could they integrate water into their public spaces as they were developing their public realm plan. And, uh, and then our partners at the Eco District hung our work in an exhibit. It was a, a two-month exhibit. They sponsored an opening day and a close our event, open and closing events as part of their art walk. Uh, and now they're proceeding with the next phase of planning for the neighborhood public realm that will again focus on public space, water, and equity goals. But what I really wanted to talk about mostly with you is our experience in New Zealand. Um, I um, was here again in 2009. I had a Fulbright Fellowship uh, to study green infrastructure in New Zealand cities, um, and especially how uh, cities were using green infrastructure to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And then I came back to just to Auckland in 2012 for a green infrastructure uh, conference. You, you, you might know where these places are. They don't look like that anymore. Of course, uh, when we got news of the earthquake, it was quite heartbreaking to, to know Christchurch and know how much it had just decimated the places that I had known and really very adversely affected so many people. So a couple of years ago, I was talking with uh, one of our graduate students, Laura Dragurian, who had been studying here at Lincoln in 2011 during the earthquake. And uh, she was planning to, to do her thesis uh, working with Jackie Bowring here. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to bring students back to do something that we could do to, to help with the resilience or regeneration. Um, and Jackie was really helpful to us, Jackie, I'm here, um, in identifying what might be possible. Um, and then also Colin Merck, who had befriended me in 2009, was like, oh yeah, we can we can do this. <laughs> so Colin really made it made it possible, um, and then I was able to get approval from our department to bring a, a, a group here. I'll just say Colin and Jackie were just the beginnings of what we would learn about the role and the depth of generosity that we've experienced here. So last year, our um, project we called. Um, Storytelling the Otakaro Avon. It was a suggestion from Hugh Nicholson, who is also a graduate of Lincoln. Does anybody know Hugh? He was, in, yeah. he was an urban designer uh, in Christchurch before and during and after the earthquake. And actually, one of, um, uh, one of Seattle's urban designers was working with him, and that's how we got connected with Hugh. And he was just finishing up with others a uh, plan from Regenerate Christchurch for what to do with these 600 hectares of what was the red zone all along the Otakaro Avon River. And I don't know how much you know about this, but during the earthquake, the lands along the Otakaro were already low. They had a lot of water in them and around them because they're close to the river. And all that shaking caused subsidence and liquefaction, and there was so much destruction that the council and the crown decided it was better to buy those properties out uh, and then rebuild. And most people get some compensation. I know it was quite traumatic uh, for many people who had to leave their homes. Um, the roads are still in place, uh, many of the utilities. The Regenerate Christchurch plan had called for a cultural trail. And just about the time we were planning this studio, the draft plan came out. It was November, last November, 2019, 2019. And it said, you know, there should be a cultural trail. And he said, what? We don't really know what this cultural trail should be. And we were like, well, we don't either, but we would love to explore what, what that could be with you. First thing we did was to go out with Colin. Uh, who took us, brought us to Lincoln, um, took us many places, um, uh, and um, yeah, and so I just will add also that uh, Hugh met with us. We had a lot of different talks, uh, as well as Jackie continued to work then with Laura. Here's some, whoops. 
some more touring with Colin, who really helped ground us with, in the ecological aspects. We're still trying to get our feet on the ground with what are all these incredibly different palette of plants. But we have a much better understanding of what, what the local ecology, what the needs and the opportunities are through our, through our traveling with Colin who's right here, I should point out. And he's going to be giving a talk in April. It's the third talk. Something like that. <laughs> okay. Don't, miss Don't miss it. Don't miss it. So um, here's uh, some pages from the Regenerate Plan that um, show the scale and scope of this going all along the river. And here is the... I'm trying to do both hands at once here. Um, here's the, sort of the master plan for what should happen and through the different reaches of the river, what could happen in all of, all of these lands and landscapes. But not really much about what the cultural trail would be. It did identify what landings would be, and Heather's going to talk about those uh, a bit, because that's what we're working on this year. Um, not the cultural trail. So our project then was to figure out what were the stories? What, what was important to tell? Um, then how could um, those get uh, developed into conceptual designs? And then how do we, how do we communicate that? The first thing we did was to document this 12 kilometer corridor with a series of transects. So every quarter of a kilometer, the students took photographs and those were mapped along here. This is a way to get to know the river. Then we held a workshop with uh, the community. We, we invited anybody, everybody we knew. Colin was again a great help with this, identifying who is it that had this knowledge? Who, who cared? Who could, who could bring um, the, the knowledge and the stories to, uh, so that we could document them? And we were focusing on pa the past, the cultural and ecological past, the, the uh, recent past of people's experience with the earthquakes, uh, as well as the future and what, what could be there. So this was the workshop where we had tables set up um, uh, around some different themes. And then we also had a big map here put notes on, and that's Craig Pauling from Baca Misco, Mapihi from Baca Misco, and he's from Regenerate Christchurch. Also what's pretty awesome here is that uh, there are uh, cultural narratives that have been written for buildings and for landscapes. Anybody seen any of these cultural narratives that are written by the, the local Nike um, that um, there was one written for the downtown where the, the new promenade through the Avon precinct is. Uh, there's a cool building that's just been renovated at the University of Canterbury that has a narrative. So we really relied on those cultural narratives and especially this one for the, the Otakaro Avon River that came out. This is the uh, Marae of the Naitu Firiri Iwi that's near to Christchurch. So we put all this together, and oh, it's got sideways. Don't ask me why it's sideways, but just um, <laughs> just take my word for it. <laughs> we produced this kind of heavy, dry document. There's a matrix of, um, if you read this one, no, we can't read it. <laughs> no. Anyway, at the top it says, um, Mahinga Kai, which is the Maori concept of stewarding the landscape and harvesting from it. Um, so, and then the matrix has the theme and then past, present, future. Um, and you can see what the different topics are, cultural landmarking, or in Maori, the tour on the wayway, settlement and colonization, water wetlands and uplands, environment adaptation, and Mahinga Kai. And this is, this is the research, right? When you're doing a project, this is the research to guide what's important. What's important to the community? What are those deep stories that you can tell through your landscape? Um, so uh, it was important to do. Then we um, worked to translate 
all these these themes and stories into design themes. And the students really said, I didn't want this to be about signage. This needed to be about experiences. And what, what could be created through their design efforts in terms of experiences? So working through the iterative design project process in four groups, uh, each uh, group selected an integrative theme. We also managed to go out on the Otakara River with Craig, who I pointed out earlier, who's uh, part of the local iwi. Who, uh, so we got to paddle with, with him and Awaka, which is awesome. And uh, then we had these cultural trail network proposals that fell into four categories. And I won't go into these too much because I have a video. I think it's going to work. But the uh, main ideas were this Mahina Kai, then Takaro is all about play because that's what Takaro translates as, memory connection and being. And then a separate group that actually was a capstone group that was working less on the themes and more on the actual space itself. So um, Mahina Kai about food and ecology. Um, that in, uh, uh, what they said is a metabolic network incorporating growth, harvest, preparation, and restoration. Uh, you'll see some of the ideas in the video. They included a seed bank center, foraging trail stations, a shellfish hatchery, and aquaponic barge. You might get some ideas for your studio projects here. <laughs> then Takaro River of Play proposed nature play, stargazing points, a craft center, a bike training park, and even, it was very controversial, that uh, there would be a flat water uh, course, a uh, rowing course here. So one of our students who was a rower said, no, that's not a good idea, but you could do it here and, uh, as a way of um, placating the, the community and also giving the great rowing space that had some ecological value. I doubt that's going to fly anywhere, but it was an interesting idea. Uh, the memory and connection and being group focused on the landings and the bridges connecting people uh, to both stories of loss and memory uh, and regeneration of the natural world. And here's Ossia's seismic bridge um, idea that this would be uh, representative of uh, one of the big earthquakes here and then the aftershocks. And then um, the Waikakariki um, Capstone team focused on this Horseshoe Lake area, which is slated for restoration and stormwater activities. And I'll talk a bit about more about their work separately. They continued the project after they came back to Seattle as a capstone. The final projects were organized into a booklet uh, called The River is a Living Story, uh, which presented the ideas then as a mosaic of possible experiences in this red zone. And then we invited everyone who had been involved with us in some way to see the final project. We had an open house in this new building on the University of Canterbury campus, the Community Engagement Hub. Um, and you might recognize some of these people. Um, do you know Neil Challenger? He's on the faculty. He taught here for many years. Uh, and Linda Burns is in charge of the interpretive planning for the Christchurch Council. So let's see if this works. It should work. Wait. How do I do this? There we go. There we go. In Christchurch, New Zealand, the Otakaro Avon River corridor was hit hard by a major earthquake in 2011. Due to intense damage from liquid action, this land has been deemed no longer safe for residential use. Eight years after the earthquake, Christchurch is reimagining this corridor as the green spine of the city with a restored wetland ecosystem. As students at the University of Washington, our interdisciplinary team embarked on a 10 day journey exploring stories and themes that could be told along the river. In coordination with the Regenerate Christchurch Plan, we have outlined possibilities for the creation of a cultural trail to be woven along Otakaro Avon River. Our designs are united by the desire to honor the past, present, and future of the corridor. We want to celebrate the river and see it clean 
for benefit of future generations. We hope that our proposals inspire imagination and contribute to the vision for the next chapter in Christ Church's future. Malinga Kai is a Maori practice which involves foraging and hunting for food. The Kassau Tapro River primarily served as a place of Malinga Kai for Maori and an agricultural farmland for early settlers. We prioritized food and habitat related programs that would recall historical and cultural significance. As a regenerating food commons, the river provides educational opportunities that have the power to cultivate relationships across communities. It allows people to holistically and symbiotically practice a new habit of engaging with Mohanga Kai, which will allow for a more diverse natural habitat and a healthier daily life. We explore ways to promote a sense of katia kihana, or stewardship, shared responsibility, and respect for the natural environment. Takaro translates to play. We envision an active corridor with opportunities to strengthen physical and mental skills, discover and engage with environment, and observe and reflect in a restored habitat. A network of interwoven trails loop and overlap along the river bank. Each landing point provides access to a range of activities in and around the water. Programming is rooted in the philosophy of learning through play, enhanced by digital applications and physical signage. Guests of all ages will connect with the rich history of Christchurch and take part in building a shared vision for sustainable and healthy futures. Otakra Avon River becomes a place for gathering, cultural exchange, and diverse recreation. Memory connects humans to place and each other, forming the identities of individuals, collections, and landscapes. The Otakra Avon River corridor contains a rich tapestry of memories, connections, and ways of being. Using a previously proposed framework of landings and pedestrian bridges along the river, we begin to think about the areas as thresholds. Each landing and pedestrian bridge becomes an opportunity to invoke memory and invite understanding, empathy, and contemplation. Memory takes many forms. It can be told, created, experienced collectively or personally, and represented in natural or human stories. Our proposals express memory in one or more of these ways and thus, a trail of memories is woven. Horseshoe Lake Reserve is located north of the Avon River Corridor. Because of the rich Mangakai Kai history and a range of remnant native vegetation and woodland habitat, it is now an ecological heritage site. The reserve is also a critical part of the city's stormwater system. The watercourse in the lake has been highly modified over time due to urbanization and the quality has been degraded significantly after the 2011 earthquake. Our project aims to restore the quality and quantity of waterways, retrofitting stormwater remediation, regenerating the native ecosystem to address concurrent and future challenges like climate change, sea level rise, and natural hazards. The Takaro Eva River Corridor represents an exciting opportunity to restore native habitat, foster ecological resilience, and connect a community to green space. We hope that our concepts help to advance this vision and take the next step toward a balanced and sustainable Christchurch. We are deeply grateful for the guidance we received from stakeholders and community members throughout our time in New Zealand and look with hope to the future of the Takaro Avon River as a living story.
And I, I'll just say, I think I know that every student on the trip just had a fantastic experience. Um, at the end, we were um, able to send back our, a booklet that, that we created. Oops, don't want that one. Oh, there we go. Um, and then the links to the, this video to everyone we thought, anyone we thought would be interested in having and using a copy so that, so that it wouldn't just be our project, but so that it could have a life that would really be uh, a way to give back for all that people had given to us. So, so we hope that it has had some positive effect. We had started our trip here. But then um, we had a little more time. It was very, the, the timing was dictated by when we could get housing at University of Canterbury. So we, we came there first. Um, so after we finished our open house and finished the booklet and video, we headed north again with Colin, where we did some volunteer work on maintaining the plantings that had been uh, installed as part of the Wipera Greening Program, which uh, was a, a restoration initiative at different Wipera wineries. Um, and then we also focused more on media studies. We did some watercoloring. We visited Kaikoura. Uh, it was sort of our the road trip part of our uh, whoops, wrong way uh, of our of our session together. We were in Wellington where we saw some awesome projects. I'm not going to say too much about those because you'll hear more about those from Heather. And in Auckland, so both in Auckland and Wellington, we really focused more on urban design because our department does quite a bit of urban design. All along the way, we integrated media studies, uh, which Paul led, um, so students could hone their skills and also explore techniques and concepts to, to expand the travel media approaches and also to ex enhance people's experiences of being in New Zealand and, and carry those with them wherever they go. The students all each did an independent study. Um, this was one that one of the capstone students did. It was this independent studies could be anything they were interested in. Um, this was a project near um, Auckland called uh, by Isthmus, um, and which actually won a World Landscape Architecture Award. Um, so it was a great one to document. And here's a list of just what these different independent studies were. You can see there's a really great, great range. And um, then I think the last thing that I want to talk about is the capstone project, the Waikakariki Futures, which you've had a bit of an um, introduction to. Uh, they defined their moves into three planning themes. You can see those over there. Uh, actually, the overarching theme was Mahinga Kai. That came from the Regenerate Christchurch plan and certainly the opportunities that were there in, in the Horseshoe Lake area. Uh, the themes were to restore to adapt and to reutilize. So habitat restoration and stormwater management came under the restore category. Uh, dealing with the sea level rise, different scenarios over time uh, under adapt. Uh, and then they did propose reutilizing the soils that would be scooped out for the stormwater wetlands to then create higher ground for more community facilities and also uh, to shape the banks. And um, it's a, it was a long project <laughs> that they did a great job on. They produced their own website. They have a link to their document if anybody's interested in seeing it. And they did win the thesis award from, uh, from the local chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. Um, the um, last thing I want to talk about is Laura's work. And just to say a little bit, um, she was working on a dual masters with planning and landscape architecture. As I mentioned, she'd been here during the earthquake and was really interested in this idea of how landscape can provide emotional infrastructure. She interviewed almost two dozen people. She taped their interviews and then she analyzed them to come up with a structure for how we think about landscape and how we think about post-disaster resilience. Um, it was a beautiful project. She also created a video and she had a lot of uh, people that, um, uh, voices of people that she taped during the interviews. I uh, said so there were quite a few tears at her, at her, um, at her presentation because uh, Susan, for example, had been uh, the, the, the um, 
urban designer working in Christchurch at the time. She was there. Anyway, it was quite moving. Um, and um, I think uh, it really is a contribution to, to the literature uh, in landscape architecture. Yeah. And she had also really been inspired by Jackie here, working with Jackie, and uh, Jackie continued to work with her through her thesis. Um, so thank you, Paul. So we all had such a positive experience. Um, we decided to reprise the opportunity. Um, and recalling our experience here last year, we for this year focusing on the concept of care, or tiaki, as applied to the Otakaro Avon corridor. And especially thinking about, um, over time, the anticipated impact of sea level rise, both short term uh, and long term. We were able to get housing at the University of Can Canterbury into March, so we flipped the trip structure, which we think has been better, to begin with the study tour in Auckland, then to Wellington, then to Christchurch, um, and uh, then we're going to all go together over to Glenorchy near Queenstown for the last few days. So at this point, I want to turn the presentation over to Heather Parker, who, as you know, is our fantastic teaching assistant, who is also a student in this year's program. So she's wearing two hats. And I'll, I'll just say it's a little challenging to hit both things at once. This is the, it's counterintuitive. This is the one that advances. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. And then you got to hit that I one might mess at the up same once time. or twice, but that's OK. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, so like Nancy said, my name is Heather Parker. I am in the second year of the Master of Landscape Architecture program um, at the University of Washington. Um, and this is actually the third time I've been to New Zealand. I was really excited to be able to come back to participate in this studio course, in large part because of this culture of care and generosity that um, Nancy has been alluding to. And it's been really inspiring through this course to see how this concept of tiaki can drive our designs and can also act as a catalyst um, for collaboration and for change. Oops, I'm sorry. Yeah, and that's kind of been, that's permeated throughout the entire um, studio experience so far. So like Nancy mentioned, uh, we started our time here in New Zealand in Auckland as part of a study tour. We were in Auckland um, for about a week. And while we were there, we experienced tremendous generosity by a few firms there, um, Isthmus, Landlab, and Botham School that took a bunch of time to give us um, site visits at some of their projects and also to give us tours of their offices and studio spaces. Um, so that was a really valuable experience for us, um, kind of in helping us ground ourselves in New Zealand. It was a crash course in New Zealand urban design. Um, and then also just really interesting to see how firms work here in New Zealand. Um, so up there you'll see uh, some of the sites we visited. Um, in the center on the top um, is Grant Bailey, who's principal at Isthmus, and he gave us a really wonderful tour of uh, Kukupaka Park, um, which is a park that uses stormwater um, detention ponds to create public space. Uh, recommend checking it out when you're up in Auckland. Um, so again, Auckland was a great introduction to New Zealand. We also were able to visit Tiri Tiri Matangi, um, or Matangi while we were there, which is an eco-sanctuary island off of the coast of Auckland. And that was a great introduction for us um, about New Zealand ecology. We uh, met a lot of New Zealand plants that we had never seen before. Um, okay. So the next week of our study tour was spent in Wellington. Um, and Wellington, um, 
in Wellington, we were really inspired by the waterfront. It was really interesting to see the waterfront projects and how they um, kind of enlivened and activated the space. Um, so we spent a lot of time exploring the waterfront and kind of trying to get into the, the minds of the designers who had made these spaces. Um, we also just learned a lot about New Zealand in general in Wellington. There were great resources like Cape Papa. Um, we learned a lot there about New Zealand cultural and natural history. Um, and uh, we visited Zealandia and saw Kiwis, which was great. Um, and we also, once again, experienced this great generosity from some of our colleagues there. Uh, for example, we were able <clears throat> to visit the Healthy Family Initiatives in Lower Hutt, which um, you'll see that picture there on the left. Um, this organization, from this organization, we learned all about their um, efforts to promote community um, well, well-being and health through community-driven projects um, and community-driven decision-making. So that was really inspiring for us, and they took a lot of time not only to talk to us, but also to drive us around to some of the communities where they worked. And then uh, we came to Christchurch, and um, we started our time here in Christchurch with a crash course in all things Christchurch, which included a great introduction um, about the Otakaro Avon River. Um, we were really fortunate to have a number of tours and presentations by all of the folks listed here on this slide, among them Colin. And um, these introductions we got to, to Christchurch were really, really integral in um, the process of grounding ourselves here in this place and then also just gaining this foundational understanding of um, this community that's been really helpful as we work on our studio project here. Um, and so um, I'll say that, um, I'll add that we'll, we're also working on independent study projects like they did last year. So um, these folks here have not only been really helpful in guiding us through our studio project, but, but have also been really generous in connecting us to other folks in the Christchurch community who have been helpful in our individual projects as well. Um, so we started our time in Christchurch um, doing some field trips that helped us get a better ecological understanding of the city and its surrounding areas. And then also um, Colin gave us a great introduction to the Red Zone. Um, Shane Orchard from the University of Canterbury gave us a great introduction to the ecology of um, um, saltwater marshes um, along the coast of Christchurch and also talked to us about sea level rise. Um, we also, oops, here we go. Um, we uh, also did a lot of exploring downtown in Christchurch as part of our process of, of learning about the city. Um, we enjoyed some of the um, both tactical, this is really loud, I'm going to turn that off, okay. <laughs> we, enjoyed, <laughs> we enjoyed checking out some of the projects that have ar arisen since the earthquake, um, including some tactical urbanism projects like the dance mat there, um, some more permanent projects like Margaret Mahe Park, um, yeah, and, oops. Sorry. Yeah. All right. There we go. <laughs> a little bit of a learning curve with operating both at once. Um, and then finally, uh, to develop our personal understanding and connection with the Otakaro Avon River, um, we did a lot of um, personal explorations through sketching, diagramming, and mapping. So here you'll see some sketching exercises um, from some of our students, including this really beautiful um, map of the river in the downtown area. So that brings me to uh, the studio project we're working on um, this year. Like Nancy mentioned, the overall focus of our studio is um, this culture of care or tiaki over time um, and more specifically we're looking at regeneration for the green spine um, and at the um, landings that have been pro proposed as part of the regeneration plan for the Otakaro Avon. 
Um, so these landings are envisioned as a way to provide access to the river and then to act both as landing points that will bring people into the green spine and then you know, send them outward into the space, and then also as focal points along the river. Um, so the regeneration plan has proposed nine of these landings. So these images are pulled directly from the regeneration plans. All of those red dots are the proposed landing locations. Um, and um, collectively, as a class, we'll be focusing on six of those landings, um, which you'll see in that graphic to the right. Um, there are five groups, and we've developed sort of these thematic concepts to go with each of the landings. So um, I guess what, oh, sorry. Um, so uh, a big focus of our studio is looking at um, how these landscapes or these landings will change over time and how we can design them so that they can adapt to changes that will be inevitable in the future, whether that be sea level rise, whether that be further economic development, whether that be cultural shifts. Um, so we started out our studio with a big focus on um, sea level rise and the Christchurch City Council has um, put together some potential stopping configurations for future sea level rise. So um, you'll see those potential configurations um, in red here on this map. Um, and in our designs for our landings, we are responding to these, um, these proposed configurations and kind of building off of them. So um, imagining what a stop bank or a levee might look like and how it might be usable as a public space has been a really fundamental part of our design process. So we began by looking at precedents to help us imagine um, or I guess to help us understand what has been done in other cities to address um, the changes that will come with sea level rise. So we looked at um, adaptation strategies around the world, um, including resilient by design projects in San Francisco. Um, we also looked at floating structures in the Netherlands. And then using the information that we gleaned from these precedent studies, uh, we developed a toolbox um, of prototypes for rising waters. Um, so basically, we developed a list of strategies that we could use in our own designs to um, adapt to sea level rise. So this could be uh, using floating walkways or floating boardwalks, could be using cut and fill on site to create wide stop banks that would actually be usable and habitable space. Um, so this has been really helpful. And then we've moved on to, we moved on to analysis. Um, so this was kind of the process of gra both grounding ourselves in our site and then also, um, or in our landings, and then also um, really trying to gain an understanding of uh, what is important about these landings or what are their defining characteristics. So here you'll see an example of some student work. We created plan sections and also tried to explore things like circulation and vegetation and context of the existing landing sites. Um, moved on to the conceptual phase. Um, here you'll see a concept diagram um, from the Wainoni landing. They're really thinking about navigation and um, also the waka in their design. And then we did this really fun exercise uh, where we created postcards um, describing some sort of vivid experience um, that might take place in our landing um, and then wrote to someone about it. So all of these steps helped us eventually get to where we are right now, which is in the schematic design phase. Um, and in our schematic designs, we're really focusing on designing at a range of spatial and temporal scales. So thinking, you know, what might the site look like or the landings look like in 10 years and 50 years and 100 years? And then what might the actual water access look like versus the larger area around the landing? So here we have some student graphics showing how the, how the Avonside landing might be impacted by inundation over 10, 50, and 100 years. 
And then um, these are uh, some student graphics from the Travis Landing. Um, and again, uh, this group is looking at inundation over the short and um, longer time frames. Um, but I think this is interesting because this is a more detailed design than, than the last graphics you saw. So, so we are also really focusing on how will people access the water? What will that experience be like? Uh, what will these actual landing points look like? So yeah, we've been working on schematic design for the last couple of weeks, and we have our mid-review tomorrow, so wish us luck. Um, Nancy, do you want to take yeah, I'll yeah. take over. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So Renata's going to join us tomorrow for our mid-review. I think we have nine people coming to give some feedback to the students. Colin's coming. Uh, to keep them on the right track, and then we have another couple of weeks is all to get to the to the end point. Tonight we've actually been, speaking of generosity again, we've been invited to go to David Lee's house. He's actually a, a Greater Wellington counselor, but he's in Christchurch. I haven't quite figured that part out, but he's, he's invited us all over to talk about sea level rise. He's a, in the Green Party and uh, is uh, is knowledgeable about that and really interested in in what we have to um, to share with him and show him our where we are right now at, at the midway. So um, just to to wrap things up, you know, it's just like what have I learned about engaged scholarship and service learning since those that original academic foray into it 50, over fifteen years ago. Well, one is um, that communities can really be moved by student work. I've just seen us go into communities that, as a professional, they might have been like, "You're not doing that in my, you know, you're not doing that in my community." And when the public sees that this work is about the future, that students are envisioning their future, they realize that they don't need to be threatened by it. And I, again, I've just seen really, uh, it's really made an impact. Um, and that secondly, communities need us. They, especially from an academic perspective, they often can't afford to hire a big firm. Um, and they need us to get those ideas started. So if you are working in this engaged scholarship service learning model, realize you can make a difference that um, and you can give to communities for something that they just couldn't otherwise. You listen, you listen to what people want, but then you have the creativity and the expertise to, to make it into something that they might have not been able to at least picture. Um, and there are um, obstacles, I will say, um, uh, particularly that in order for things to hold, there needs to be continued engagement. And that's pretty challenging in the context of an academic term. And I, I think uh, anybody who's teaching here, <laughs> Julian, you, that you, you just know that it's just, it, it, you have to keep it up. So you really need to have those partners. Uh, you need to have the advocates and make those connections with the stakeholder groups. If you're working in a firm, you often, you don't have the fee. You know, nobody's paying you to continue that engagement. So um, as citizens, as landscape architects, I think we can really contribute our knowledge and our um, expertise and creativity, even if it's a project that somebody else has designed. Um, and I went the wrong way. <laughs> and then also the products need to be consumable, right? I think that are use useful. And that's why maybe the video's right, maybe the website, the booklets. We're trying to figure out what format that will leave our work in this year. Um, and, um, and partnerships are challenging when you're doing a study abroad term. And that's where um, I found, I mean, usually we go to Copenhagen, we come home, and we've got all that network. But here, it's really been reliant on the generosity and these relationships that we've established. So it's been really worth it to spend the time uh, and, and, and to, to um, make these relationships. Um, and these relationships do matter. And we've kind of gotten a sense that because we came back, that we are more trusted, that there is more expectation of something that we could do. So, so hopefully we will be able 
to, um, to contribute uh, and continue to, to come. And then, of course, from our side, when we travel, we just bring home the most powerful kind of learning I think there can be, you know, that you are experiencing a place. I think that's why, as landscape architects, we do have such power. We create places that people absorb learning from just intuitively. Right? They don't necessarily have to read a sign to, to, to learn from it. And then we can bring the, those experiences back to our home communities and our projects. And that's led me to be convinced that, that uh, generosity is key. It's, it's elemental. And we just have, are so grateful for all the generosity that's been shown to us. Um, this was our final dinner last year. This is Alan Palmer, who uh, works at University of Canterbury as a project manager. His wife, Jo, they just invited us over to have our final dinner in their garden and cooked all the, you know, half the food at least. And Alan's also been instrumental in helping us with housing at, at the university uh, and, and many other things. So, so it just keeps going on and on. We're just really, really pleased. So um, we would um, like to invite you all to come see our final work. It's, it will be at the University of Canterbury in the Community Engagement Hub, that same room where we were last year in the Rahula building, which is cool. It's, whoops, um, it's uh, the building where uh, this, um, this cultural narrative has been written. As you can see it in the building itself. They, there's a new seismic retrofit and amazing Maori art in it. Uh, and right now, we're pretty sure it's going to be 4 to 6 p.m. And it's right in the center of the University of Canterbury campus. So we hope we'll see some of you there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Heather, for sharing your experience with us. And uh, thank you for that last slide with the challenges and your own reflections on your experience. I'm sure that's very helpful for everyone as lecturers and as students. Um, we're going to open the floor for discussions and uh, questions. Do you guys have any questions or like to know something about something? Yes. Uh, I don't think I have any questions basically for you. But you mentioned the most complicated for the idea. The emotional um, designing for emotional connection, is that what you mean? Yeah. I read that statement. And you should take a view to a partner and make it very true. Um, you mean Yeah, I think you mean the thesis project that we designed on? Um, I think the, she had this idea that through the relationship we have by taking care of one kid, we get back. Her experience of shoveling out the perfection, student army all working together, it, it gave them a sense of strength and camaraderie and there's something they could do. So that was the genesis of her thinking. If we take care of the landscape, that process will also help us become stronger with that connection. And I think all the literature on place attachment would say that there's a lot of studies on uh, landscape restoration and how that actually builds community. So you've, you've got that personal experience, but you also have the other people that you're working with, but you can see the results of what you can do, right? So it's empowering and healing. And I think that, that does give us emotional strength, right? To know that we, we're resilient, right? Being through the land.
other experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, the first one I showed was taking students to Alaska, and I've done that twice, working in community, two different small communities in Alaska. And that that just takes funding. We had um, a client who said they would love the students' help, and about one was um, much and there were different projects, and, um, and so the students were able, one of them went back twice, um, and so that was uh, 2003 or 2005, I think, that I did that. Um, and I've done a dozen trips to Copenhagen, taking students where we don't typically stay in Copenhagen and do a project there. At one time, we did choose a site in Copenhagen, but it was fun and interesting, but they weren't so interested in it. But for us, when we come back to Seattle, we can really make a difference. Um, I think the students on a West Coast tour of looking at sustainability initiatives at different universities, a transplant project in Seattle, the university, um, but natural planning that we are doing. So it usually just depends on the funding. Um, we were talking about New Orleans. We also got funding, and we had a tour of three years that Really challenging, you know, to be running a group. 
something for someone whose job it is just to make the relationships, uh, keep, they keep those going. That's the good thing. Also, just say the first thing, you know, don't we come, come here, that's all I could be. Very well connected. So he points us in the right direction. And then we do try to keep up those relationships. I'm sure it was a bit of a challenge, I think, that we sent the booklet, we sent the video. We don't know if anything really came of that. But right before that formal shooting in Christchurch, maybe the tension shifted off of it. Or maybe we've done our work to say, this might be possible. If people aren't interested in still uh, exploring what you might want to do or might not want to do, right? It's still really useful. As long as that communication has been out, I think that is a really good challenge to get that. It's also wonderful that the students invariably are willing to kind of stick their necks out and say, We're we've learned all we can uh, so now and now we're gonna make a proposition. Um, and what do you think? You know, like is it is this a good idea or is it not? So being willing to make a proposition and enter into a dialogue and getting feedback. And that's been very important too, is to not be fearful of being wrong or, or um, inappropriate or whatever. Being res respectful and responsible as you can be, but also be willing to put something out. Um, and I think it's helped the people in the communities um, also to clarify some of their own thinking, um, just to see something maybe that they don't necessarily